Since the attack on our capital, the Department of Justice has remained committed to ensuring accountability for those criminally responsible for what happened that day. This case is brought consistent with that commitment, and our investigation of other individuals continues. Special counsel Jack Smith dropping all federal charges against Donald Trump, not because he wants to, but because he has to. I'm Ellison Barber in for Gotti Schwartz, and this is Stay Tuned Now. Tonight, a judge officially ending the federal election interference case against President-elect Donald Trump, hours after special counsel Jack Smith moved to drop all federal charges against him. That includes four felony charges in the election case and more than 30 felony charges in the classified documents case. Smith indicted Trump in both cases last summer, but since then they've endured several legal twists and turns. Chief among them, Trump's re-election, something Smith noted in his court filings, writing in part, quote, the government's position on the merits of the defendant's prosecution has not changed, but the circumstances have. Let's bring in NBC News justice and intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian for more. Ken, help us understand this a little better. Smith seemed to be making it clear that he believes the government has had and still will have a strong case against Donald Trump, but that it's going to sort of stop here. Is that right? That's absolutely right, Ellison. And he, Jack Smith had to do this. He had no choice because he's an employee of the Justice Department. And when Donald Trump was elected president, Jack Smith asked the DOJ's Office of Legal Counsel, that's their kind of constitutional law arm, whether the Justice Department policy that a sitting president can't be indicted or prosecuted, whether that would apply to Donald Trump even before he takes office after having been elected president, because obviously this has never happened before. And they came back with the answer, yes, it does apply, and these charges should be dropped even before he's inaugurated. And so Jack Smith decided to do that himself rather than resign and wait for example, for the Ch Trump Justice Department to do that. And, and by doing that, he gets control over how the charges are dropped. This case uh, was dismissed uh, without prejudice, meaning in theory it could be refiled, although that is not likely to happen. Uh, but uh, he gets to say in this filing, as you, as you pointed out, that uh, he stands by the merits of the charges and believes he could have proved these cases in court and is only dropping them because of this Justice Department rule. And we all knew this was happening, right? As soon as Americans voted Donald Trump into office, uh, it was well known that these cases would go away, Ellison. So whenever in any situation when a case is dropped and there may not be uh, further action in court, the files, the evidence that was collected through the investigation still exist. Is, I assume that will still be the case here. And my question on that is, will the public ever get an opportunity to see the report and the findings that Smith and his team says they have as it relates to this investigation in full? Well, Ellison, the, the public has already seen the bulk of the findings in two indictments that lay out reams of evidence supporting these criminal charges. That's what criminal investigations are. They gather evidence in support of charges. Are there other things that they've gathered that haven't been made public? Absolutely. And that stuff is usually secret uh, in any context, whether there's a special counsel or not, uh, because it's grand jury information. It is an interesting question, though, what happens to all the evidence in this case? Uh, where does it go? Does it get destroyed? Could Donald Trump order it destroyed? I I've been asking that question. I haven't gotten a, a good answer. I mean, normally these kinds of things are just stored in files in the Justice Department, but Donald Trump has a reason to try to make this evidence go away. But in any event, the indictments themselves serve as a summary of the most substantial evidence in both the January 6th case and the classified documents case, mm -hmm. Ellison. Trump's pick for Attorney General Pam Bondi previously vowed to prosecute, quote unquote, bad prosecutors who had indicted Donald Trump. I want to play some of what she had to say in the past about this for viewers. Then you and I will talk right after. The Department of Justice, the prosecutors will be prosecuted, the bad ones. The investigators will be investigated because the deep state last pre term for President Trump, they were hiding in the shadows. But now they have a spotlight on them and they can all be investigated and the House needs to be cleaned out. So that was August of 2023. It's one thing to say that as a commentator, but is that something from a legal perspective now that she has most likely going to be in this very elevated position. Is that something that if she wanted to do, she could do something like that? Does Jack Smith have a reason to be afraid here? 
Well, she certainly could appoint a special counsel, as was as happened in the first Trump administration. Remember, John Durham was appointed special counsel to investigate the Mueller investigation. And that certainly could happen in this case. Uh, but she knows full well that the FBI acted properly here and there was no corrupt motive, despite all this rhetoric. She's a lawyer, a former prosecutor, attorney general for eight years of Florida. She knows how this works. You need predication to open an investigation. There are grand juries. There are all kinds of fail safes. That doesn't mean they did everything perfectly. And there certainly could be a review of the Jack Smith investigation. And that might require them to hire lawyers. And it might be very unpleasant for them. But there's been no evidence, despite all these charges from Donald Trump of weaponization and political motives. I've covered these investigations for two years. I haven't seen a scintilla of evidence to support that charge. What I have seen is the political appointees, Merrick Garland and others, staying far, far away from this investigation and letting career Justice Department officials handle it. Uh, but again, th that's what reviews are for. They'll, we'll, we'll find out in the end, Allison. All right. Really important context and information all around. Ken Delaney, and thank you so much. We appreciate it. You bet. Sticking with the president-elect and some breaking news tonight on Truth Social. Trump announcing there that one of his first executive actions will be tariffs on Mexico, Canada and China. He blamed China for, quote, massive amounts of drugs being sent to the United States, claiming drugs like fentanyl are mostly coming from China and mostly, he said, through Mexico. Again, all of this according to his post on Truth Social. He said there that Mexico and Canada would face a 25 percent tariff on all products, while China would face an additional 10 percent on top of the current rate. Meanwhile, over the weekend, Trump filled out the top roles for his second administration. All 15 executive level nominees for his cabinet have now been chosen. Trump's pick for Treasury Secretary Scott Bessent appears to be good news for Wall Street. All of the major averages ended in the green today. The Dow Jones was up more than 400 points to close at a new record. Senior White House correspondent Gabe Gutierrez joins us now from the White House with more. So, Gabe, break this down for us. What is behind Wall Street's reaction to Besson's nomination? Well, Allison, the Dow just hit a record high because Wall Street is breathing a sigh of relief. Investors don't like volatility or unpredictability. And after cabinet picks like Matt Gates, Besson is seen as a safe choice. Now, he's a 62-year-old hedge fund executive. And while he was once the chief investor at George Soros's firm. He has been an outspoken, outspoken supporter of Trump's agenda, and he's viewed as a realist. Remember, Elon Musk wanted someone else because he felt Besant was sort of a business-as-usual pick. Well, it turns out Wall Street apparently likes that, Alice. Hmm. You know, there's been a lot of talk, Gabe, about the Trump transition team seemingly bypassing what would be typical behavior for cabinet nominees, uh, namely background checks prior to making nominations. Let's listen to what two senators said when asked about that over the weekend, then we'll talk right after. I don't think the American public cares who does the background checks. What the American public cares about is to see the mandate that they voted in delivered upon. So, so to be clear, you don't think there should be hearings until... Uh, the background checks are completed. Sometimes it is an ongoing process, and you could do it at the same time, but we just need the background checks. We need the hearings. When you're talking to your sources, Gabe, where do things stand in the Senate, especially right now, in terms of this idea of with or without background checks? Look, Allison, that idea has divided the Republican conference. You know, some Republicans don't like the idea of taking background check authority from the FBI. And as you just heard, you know, senators like Susan Collins, uh, Lisa Murkowski, Kevin Kramer, they've also uh, expressed reservations. But look, many in the GOP agree with Trump's claims that the DOJ has become weaponized. So they're just not inclined to trust the FBI. And as you heard, Republican Senator Bill Hegarty, um, you know, he said that Americans don't really care who does those background checks. We'll have to see how this plays out in Congress next year. We're also hearing, Gabe, that the Trump team hasn't signed anything related to ethic rules so far. Walk us mm. through what those are and what the consequences of not signing something like that could be. Well, none, apparently. Ethics experts say that the president is exempted from conflict of interest laws because he oversees too many areas to make the enforcement practical. And, you know, the system relies on a president's good faith effort to separate his personal interests from the countries when he takes office. However, the Supreme Court, as you might remember, uh, it ruled that Trump, as a former president and you know now president again, he will be immune from prosecution for official acts. So 
within three days after winning the election, Trump denied on True Social that he was selling shares of the parent company of uh, his social media platform. So again, we will just have to wait and see. Else. Okay. NBC's senior White House correspondent Gabe Gutierrez at the White House tonight. Thank you. Over in Los Angeles, the highly anticipated resentencing hearing of the Menendez brothers has now been postponed to January. It was supposed to be in two weeks on December 11th, but a judge ruled today that it is being rescheduled to give the incoming district attorney more time to review the case. Both Eric and Lyle Menendez were going to appear in court today virtually from the San Diego prison where they currently are. But that did not end up happening because of technical issues. The brothers have served 35 years for killing their parents, Jose and Kitty Menendez. But their case got new life in recent months after Netflix released a series and a documentary was released on Peacock related to the murders. NBC News correspondent Dana Griffin joins us now from Los Angeles with more. Dana, you were in court today. Walk us through what happened. How did things play out? Everyone was expecting to sort of see them in a courtroom virtually, but it would have been the first time to see the brothers back in court since the since they were sentenced to prison, Abs right? Absolutely. And it was a big letdown for people that came into the courtroom to physically see them on camera. They, they weren't shown because of technical issues. We did hear them. At one point, their attorney asked if they could hear and see the proceedings, and they said, yes, we're here, and that they can hear and see what was going on. We heard from two witnesses that were called to the stand. Um, that was the only thing the judge allowed because these two women, they're the aunts of the brothers. They are elderly, and they have some health challenges. Uh, we heard some compelling testimony. They described just you know, why they feel the brothers should get out. They say, you know, what they did was wrong. We acknowledge that, but they want them home. They want to hug them. They want to see them. They believe they have been rehabilitated and believe that 35 years is long enough. Now, when it comes to people just trying to see what was going on, dozens of people waited in line outside of the courtroom starting at seven o'clock this morning just to get lottery tickets for those coveted 16 seats they they drew several names or drew several tickets and those people got to witness inside i spoke to two of the people that actually made it inside listen to what they told me i'm just very interested in the case i've been following it for a long time and with the new evidence i want to see what happens with the trial i believe with the time already served that uh in the new evidence that they should get out i just want to see that uh, he's, he's, he's doing well and, you know, he's healthy and that, you know, he's happy and the changes are made and that he's come to terms with what happened. You believe they were molested? I know they were molested. And talk about just intrigue for this case. There was actually a camera crew from France. There was a media spectacle out there, several cameras, several people just wanting to get close to the action. And with a case like this, I asked one person, I said, why is this drawing so much attention? And they just say they can't believe these two rich kids from Beverly Hills would murder their parents. And because of the Netflix documentary and the Peacock documentary and all of the, the news and, and attention surrounding this case, they feel that they did not get a fair shot during their second trial. Well, and a lot of people believe these brothers should be released. Ellison? Dana, talk to us about the DA situation here. What did the outgoing DA, George Gascon, want to do in this case? And the incoming DA, Nathan Hochman, where does he stand on these questions about resentencing? Yeah, so... Uh, outgoing DA Gascon, he is the one who petitioned to have these brothers resentenced. So that is why we've got these hearings ongoing. He believes that the brothers have been rehabilitated and that they have served their time and that because the element of abuse was not introduced during their case, he believes that there was some sort of miscarriage of justice here. So he hopes that they get released. Um, but You've got this incoming DA who's going to be sworn in on December 2nd. He still needs time to review the case, and that's part of why they postponed the resentencing hearing to January. And even uh, Nathan Hockman, he released a statement. He says that because of Judge Jasek's decision, it allows him sufficient time to review the extensive prison records. He says he's going to go through the transcripts of both of those lengthy trials. And he says he also wants to talk to victim family members. So he has vowed to review this case. He may come up with a, a, a different different decision. He may say, hey, I don't think that they should be resentenced. But at this point, it sounds like this case is going to continue and we'll
we'll just have to wait to see. You know, the attorney for the brothers hoped they would be out by Thanksgiving, then hoped they would be out by Christmas. But we now know that they won't even know their fate until sometime next year. Ellison. NBC's Dana Griffin in Los Angeles. Thank you. NBC News legal analyst Angela Sinadella is here with us now for more on this situation. Angela, let's just sort of pick up where Dana left off there on this idea of an incoming DA. They can make a recommendation to a judge in terms of resentencing, right? But ultimately, we don't know what the judge is going to do and kind of when they decide to move ahead and talk, that's that's really all up in the air, right? That's exactly right. So all of the official power is in the judge. The mm -hmm. judge is the only one who can decide to officially resentence the brothers or to make a decision on this habeas petition, which remains outstanding. However, the district attorney is imperative in greenlighting the process. So you don't have a judge just deciding to resentence defendants without the district attorney's office on board. That's why Gascon's approval of this petition his bringing it forth to the court was imperative to moving the process forward. Otherwise, you would have defendants all coming to the judge and saying, just please resentence me here, left and right. But what Gascon did is he brought to the judge authority, and he said that, look, these brothers truly were model inmates behind bars. I believe that they have paid their debt to society. Those worries carry, well, words carry so much power with the judge. So mm -hmm. if this new DA comes in and has a totally different recommendation, Everything could change. It is very unlikely that a judge would rule in favor of resentencing without Hoffman's recommendation. You mentioned the habeas petition. Remind viewers, we're talking about a couple different legal buckets, if you will. I think you've used that term before when it relates to the Menendez brothers and this case. There's questions about new evidence that was allegedly discovered uh, in a letter and also in that Peacock documentary we mentioned. Then there are people who say, oh, well, resentencing is being discussed because of the Netflix TV show. Then there's, I mean, there's just a lot here. So remind us of the different components at play. Yes, yeah, so there's three different tracks right now. And frankly, all of these documentaries gave a tremendous amount of momentum to all three different mm -hmm. paths. So the first is clemency. And any defendant can ask the governor in this case for clemency. However, Newsom has said that he won't even make a decision on this until he hears Hawkman's recommendation. So again, the DA there is imperative. Mm -hmm. Now, the second, though, is this resentencing, which was something that should have been discussed today had the original DA been in place. And that petition specifically regards their behavior behind bars. So for that, Gascon said, these individuals paid their debt. They will no longer be threats. They will reintegrate safely. So if that's the case, why should we keep them behind bars? That was resentencing, and that is what the judge will decide on. Now, this third path, which actually mm -hmm. Gascon never officially endorsed, so Hawkman really won't have any difference of opinion there, mm -hmm. is the habeas petition. Now, that is more of a constitutional issue. It's we are being unfairly detained for constitutional issues because the evidence, had it been introduced, would have resulted in a totally different outcome. Come. But that is a moonshot. That is not something that really courts tend to listen to unless the evidence is so jarring that would have definitively changed the outcome, which is not necessarily clear here. So that is the only one where Hawkman's recommendation will be irrelevant. All right. Really interesting stuff. A lot to watch here. Angela Sinadella, thank you as always. We appreciate it. Meanwhile, a ceasefire deal may be on the horizon in the Middle East after a deadly weekend in Lebanon. Today, people in central Beirut are still digging through the rubble of an eight-story building completely leveled by Israeli airstrikes on Saturday. At least 29 people, including children, were killed in those blasts. In a sign of retaliation, Hezbollah sent a barrage of rockets towards Israel on Sunday. The IDF says it struck a neighborhood, destroying a number of homes and cars. All of this as a ceasefire deal between Israel and Hezbollah seems to be closer than ever. Three senior Biden administration officials telling NBC News that there are a few things left to be resolved and it could take a couple more days. But until then, the fighting in Lebanon and northern Israel continues, as you saw there. And with Iran's supreme leader calling for a death sentence for Israel's leaders, the threat of escalation remains high. Joining us now is Hagar Shamali. She is the former spokesperson for the U.S. mission to the U.N. and former director for Syria and Lebanon at the National Security Council at the White House. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Let's just start with what we're hearing from some senior White House officials, administration officials, in terms of a ceasefire deal between Israel and Hezbollah. The U.S. in the last few months has been 
The more optimistic voice on whether or not a ceasefire could happen as it related to the fighting in Gaza, and often the U.S. leaders saying, we think we can get there, were wrong because Israeli officials and Hamas officials were saying, no, we're not going to have an agreement. What's happening here? Do you think a ceasefire is actually on the horizon for Hezbollah and Israel? Sure. And yeah, you, not, you make a very good point. The U.S. has, especially with regards to this conflict, appeared a bit more optimistic than the situation on the ground. But I do believe that this one is different. And the reason for that is that you don't have a lot of the complicating factors that you do when it comes to reaching a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. When it comes to a ceasefire between Israel and Lebanon, first of all, Israel's not negotiating with a terrorist group directly. They are negotiating with the Lebanese government and the Lebanese armed forces. So they're, they're negotiating with a state actor. And that state actor is much more rational and has a goal there that is actually shared in this case with Israel, that they both don't want actually to be involved in this war. So that's the first. The second is that you don't have hostages involved. Hostages complicate things significantly in, in ceasefire negotiations. So you don't have that. Third is that Israel has significantly decimated Hezbollah's leadership and its commanders, and I don't want to underestimate the result that that will have in allowing the Lebanese government and Lebanese armed forces in controlling the South, which is ultimately what Israel wants. And the fourth is the ultimate goal here. And when you compare to Gaza, for example, Israel's goal is to defeat and, quote, eradicate Hamas. They are doing that in response to October 7th. Whereas Hezbollah did not execute the, the October 7 terrorist attack. They started lobbing missiles in solidarity with Hamas. And the goal there is not to eradicate Hezbollah, but to return Israeli residents to the north. That is their, their main stated goal. And that's why a ceasefire here is more achievable. So now, these things are always tenuous. Anything could throw it off the table. But I have more hope with this one. Hmm. Really fascinating context there. If there were to be a ceasefire between Hezbollah and Israel and the residents in northern Israel are able to go home. People in southern Lebanon who have had to evacuate from their homes are able to go back. Do we think there could be an impact on what's happening inside of Gaza, or do you think it will really play out separately because of some of the things you mentioned, like hostages and just what happened in the terror attack on October 7th? Yeah, I believe it will play out absolutely separately. And unfortunately, I don't expect much movement on a possible Israel-Gaza ceasefire or, unfortunately, the release of additional hostages uh, until uh, the new administration comes in. And, and I don't say that because I think that, that President-elect Trump will do a better job on this. I just don't see any movement while Biden is in office on this issue. And very quickly, before we let you go, Hagar, in terms of what we've heard from Iran's supreme leader calling for death sentences for Netanyahu and other Israeli leaders, what do you make of that? Is it just bluster or is this a, a more significant threat? No, I think it's just bluster and it's pure theater coming from Iran's leader, um, from their supreme leader. And to be honest with you, it's not that shocking. I mean, almost every speech he makes, he chants death to America. And so it's not shocking that he's going to say that he thinks on top of this ICC, uh, the International Criminal Court arrest warrant for Netanyahu, that there be a death sentence attached to it. Um, but that said, I, you know, it is pure theater. He's trying to capitalize on that. And I don't want to imply that any arrest warrant from the International Criminal Court is symbolic. None of them are symbolic. Mm. But that said, I don't think Netanyahu or, Ga or Gallant are going to go travel to the countries, namely the EU, where they could be arrested. And therefore, I don't see it being carried out. All right. Agar Shamali, thank you so much. We appreciate, appreciate your time and insights. Thanks. Don't go anywhere because we are just getting started. A Macy's employee is caught red-handed hiding millions from the company for years. How they got away with it for so long. That is up next. Plus, airport workers in North Carolina are on strike during what is expected to be the busiest week for air travel ever. What that means for your plans and how you can stay prepared for any travel hiccups. And later this hour, sequels are taking over theaters. How part two of your favorite films are smashing the box office in ways we haven't seen before. Welcome back. Here are some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. Brian Kobayashi, the father of a missing Hawaii woman, has died by suicide in Los Angeles. Police say he was found by a parking lot, a parking structure near LAX early yesterday morning. He was in L.A. searching for his daughter, Hannah. She has not been heard from in two weeks. In a statement shared with NBC News, the family says they are asking for support and consideration during this difficult time and reminding people they still need the public's help in locating Hannah. 
She is still actively missing and believed to be in imminent danger. A Tennessee judge ruling in favor of separate trials for the former police officers accused in the death of Tyree Nichols. Nichols was beaten by five officers in Memphis back in January of 2023. He died three days later. Three of the men have pleaded not guilty to all charges. Their attorneys argued that their trial needed to be separated from those who have pleaded guilty. The trial is set to begin in April. And Macy's revealing today that one of their employees hid up to $154 million for nearly three years. The employee was responsible for the accounting of small package delivery expenses and intentionally, they say, punched some wrong numbers. Macy says that person is no longer with the company and they're investigating. Listen up, Hyundai drivers. We have a pair of recalls involving nearly 190,000 vehicles. The big one involves the Ion IC5 and 6s, along with several Genesis models. Issues with the EV's charging unit could leave cars without power on the road. The other recall involves 2025 Santa Cruz and Tucson models. Those cars can shift out of park without the brake pedal being applied. Dealers will fix those issues for free. And it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas at the White House. First Lady Jill Biden welcoming the official White House Christmas tree today. It comes from a North Carolina farm that was devastated by Hurricane Helene. The tree is named Tree Mendes. The ex-Kentucky sheriff accused of killing a district judge in his chambers pleading not guilty today to a new murder charge. Sean Mickey Steins was in court following the grand jury's indictment. He's still being held in jail without bond. The judge in the case citing, quote, community safety concerns and security concerns. We do want to warn you, some of the video we are about to show you is disturbing. NBC News correspondent Maura Barrett has this report. Allison, this was a very brief arraignment hearing earlier today at the Letcher County Courthouse. The defense attorney for former Sheriff Sean Mickey Steins uh, entering a not guilty plea on his behalf. Now, it's important to note, this is the first time the sheriff has been back in this courthouse uh, since the incident unfolded. That surveillance video, absolutely shocking, uh, watching him walk into the judge's chambers and allegedly shoot the judge several times. Now, what's interesting is that the defense attorney isn't denying that Steins shot and killed uh, the the judge, they're just saying that the murder charge of a public official is too severe because they're saying that the sheriff uh, did this under, quote, extreme emotional disturbance. So they're trying to argue that this should be dropped down to a manslaughter charge. Now, we see what we saw in the video, right? But there's several things that happened before that we have not seen but was testified to uh, by a Kentucky state police during the preliminary hearing. Now, what we know unfolded according to this testimony just before the shooting is that Stein's walked into the chambers, tried to call his daughter from his cell phone, then asked the judge for his cell phone and tried to call his daughter from that phone. Now, phone records apparently show that phone calls to Stein's daughter had been made from the judge's phone previously. We don't have an official motive on the record, uh, but this is clearly an emotional uh, situation that we saw unfold here, and there's a lot that it will be uncovered uh, as this goes to trial. Stein's will be held in jail uh, without bond, the judge said today, because it is a community safety and security concern. Uh, it is important to note if that charge, the murder of a public official, holds, if convicted, Steins could face the death penalty. Allison? Mara Barrett, thank you. Coming up, another recall alert after batches of raw milk tested positive for bird flu. What you need to know or throw out ahead. But first, you got to see this. A 77-year-old tradition continued today. Raised by the, yeah, I hear you. I hereby pardon Peach and Blossom. President Joe Biden turning to some actual birds and pardoning two Thanksgiving turkeys. Meet Peach and Blossom, a nod to Delaware's Peach Blossoms, the official flower of Biden's home state. The president kept it light but ended on a heartfelt note saying that being president has been the honor of his life. We'll be right back. Bird flu has been on the rise lately. We have seen it infect cows and pigs and even humans. Now it's made its way to raw milk. NBC News correspondent Ann Thompson has more on the serious spread. A batch of whole raw milk being voluntarily recalled tonight in California after health officials detected bird flu in a sample sold in stores. It comes from Raw Farms LLC of Fresno in quarts and half gallons with a Best Buy date of November 27th. 
Raw Farm says its own tests were negative. I can't imagine any benefits from drinking raw milk. I Megan Davis is an environmental health have. professor at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg. Were you surprised that there's a recall of raw milk in California? I was not surprised to hear this because right now California is the epicenter of the current outbreak of H5N1 in dairy cows. There are 29 confirmed human bird flu cases in California, all with direct contact to infected cows except for a child. None are linked to raw milk. Officials have long warned that raw milk can pose serious health risks because it can carry dangerous germs such as E. coli, salmonella, and listeria. What is it that makes raw milk so risky? Raw milk comes from the udder of the cow. The cow itself can have an infection that can be shed into the milk. Pasteurization heats milk at high temperatures to kill the germs. Despite the risks, raw milk has some high-profile proponents. Health and Human Services nominee Robert F. Kennedy Jr. two years ago. Since I was here last year, I only drank raw milk. Actress Gwyneth Paltrow says she puts raw cream in her coffee. Social media filled with lesser-known advocates. This is why you should be drinking raw milk. A risk some 10 million Americans are willing to take each year. Ann Thompson, NBC News. Are you planning on traveling for the Thanksgiving holiday? If you said yes, you are not alone. Nearly 80 million other Americans are expected to travel this week as well. And for those of you flying, the head of the TSA says it will be the busiest Thanksgiving ever for air travel. So let's bring in NBC News correspondent Adrian Brada. She is at Chicago's O'Hare Airport. Adrian, it sounds a little bit busy already, but busiest Thanksgiving ever could be a nightmare for people traveling. Do we think this is going to be an arrive four hours before your flight situation or a to just say the stereotypical line, a pack your patience and just get ready because you're in for it sort of thing? You know, Ellison, four hours, I guess it never hurts, but the recommendation is to arrive at least two hours before your flight is scheduled to depart. And yes, as you mentioned, the TSA is estimating this will be the busiest Thanksgiving on record. Starting tomorrow, TSA agents expect they will screen nearly 18 million people through next week. And because of that, some folks who spoke with us today said they wanted to leave early. Take a listen. Never Tuesday or Wednesday, and we fly home next Tuesday, so to, to miss the big stuff. It is much more dead than I thought it would be. I thought a lot of people would be trying to beat the traffic. And leaving early for some of those passengers not only meant saving time, but money. A few folks we spoke with today said they chose to travel today because that's where they found the lowest airfare. And they also avoided long wait times. The average wait throughout the day has been about 20 minutes here at O'Hare. Ellison? That is efficiency. We'd love to hear that. I mean, talk to us a little bit about what's going on in Charlotte because their international airport there, Charlotte Douglas International, workers are on strike, right? Is that something that could impact domestic holiday travel in that city and beyond? There in Charlotte, the impact will be minimal. You're talking about essential workers who are demanding better wages. These are the folks who clean the airplanes or may help folks who need extra assistance as they get off of the plane, folks who use wheelchairs. A spokesperson with one of the companies representing some of those workers said they have taken steps to minimize disruptions. And that strike in Charlotte is only expected to last one day. Now, here is where you could see some potential delays. Obviously, we have weather that's coming in. And there is a shortage of air traffic controllers across the country. That could lead to some delays, and we've already seen that at, in New York. Hmm. Ellison? Yeah, so of the 80 million expected travelers, over 71 million are expected to travel by car. National gas prices seem to be down from last month and this time last year. But as you mentioned, we are hearing that there could be some problematic weather on the way. What should people know if they're going to be driving? Yeah, Ellison, the weather could cause a few challenges, at least from California to the northeast. We could see storms in the Midwest. We're expecting rain. And then in the northeast, they're in for a soaking that could 
possibly impact the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. But ending on a good note, compared to this time last year, for those who will be driving, you're not paying as much for gas this time around. Ellison? All right, Adrian brought us in Chicago. Thank you. And for more on what to expect from the weather this week, let's turn to meteorologist Bill Karens. Hey, Bill. Ellison, this isn't the week anyone wants to deal with a big storm system, and it's not going to affect the entire country. We're not going to have a lot of cancellations or people like not able to get to their destinations. That's going to be isolated, but we'll talk about that coming up. So here's our two players on the board. We have our one storm that's going to exit the East Coast tomorrow. It's going to bring mostly rain, just a little bit of freezing rain in northern New England. The bigger storm, the one that's going to go coast to coast, is now coming into California. That's going to make its way all the way to the East Coast by Thanksgiving evening. So that's going to be impactful. So this storm, as we went through to go through tonight and through tomorrow, heads into the Intermountain West. It's a fast-moving storm, so any area that it hits is now going to be short-lived. Rain and snow throughout the ele higher elevations. It looks like Denver itself, mostly rain, some wet snow mixed in, but all of the you know Interstate 70 driving up in the foothills, that's where you're going to start to get some problems. I-25, isolated spots of problems. By the time we get to Wednesday, our storm is in the middle of the country already, knocking onto the, uh, into the Ohio Valley by about 8 p.m. Light rain develops in a large area. This is not going to cause cancellations of flights, but it will maybe cause some delays. Obviously, driving in the rain will slow you down a little bit, but you shouldn't have any issues besides that. We're not really looking at cold enough temperatures for any snow. By the time we get to Wednesday evening, that's when the rain breaks out. Most of the daytime travels just fine, the exception being there in the uh, you know, four corner region and also into Colorado. Denver Airport could be problematic. Then on Thanksgiving Day, this all makes it to the East Coast. So for Thanksgiving itself, if you're from Chicago to Houston, New Orleans, West, you are totally fine Thanksgiving Day for driving anywhere your destinations take you. But on the East Coast, especially early in the day, from D.C. to New York to Philly, Baltimore, up into Hartford and then Boston, heavy rain possible Thanksgiving Day. And yes, of course, that does mean possibly a very, very soggy parade. Northern New England could have the issues more with snow, especially all of the high elevations. So we put all of our highways in red here. Again, we don't expect you not to be able to get through, but you will have significant delays. And if you're traveling through any of the mountainous areas on Thanksgiving, that's where the worst concerns could be. And as we mentioned, the parade, it looks soggy. I don't see any way that the storm misses. It just depends on how heavy the rain will be. The wind shouldn't be too bad, so the balloons can still fly, but you'll see a lot of people wearing ponchos. As far as the snow forecast is going to go, our European computer model has the highest snow totals, and you notice that in the Adirondacks, the Catskills, the Green Mountains, and the White Mountains, these are areas that could even see moderate to heavy snowfall, and that would most likely be during the day on Thanksgiving into Thanksgiving evening. Then by Friday, that storm exits. So, Allison, there are concerns out there, but primarily it's going to be in the Northeast on Thanksgiving Day. Bill Karens, thank you. Coming up, a major storm leaves a deadly path of destruction in the United Kingdom. We're taking a closer look at the aftermath ahead. Welcome back. Let's take a quick look around the world. In Lithuania, a DHL cargo plane crashed into a house near Vilnius Airport, killing one crew member and injuring three others. Twelve people were evacuated from the home. Right now, it's unclear if an investigation, it's unclear what caused it, but an investigation into the cause is underway. At least 16 people are missing after a tourist yacht sank in the Red Sea. The recovery mission is still underway. We're told 44 people were on board, including the crew. It's not clear what caused the boat to sink, but there were high wave warnings for that area. Officials say the boat did not have any technical problems prior to departing and had all of the required permits. Uruguay has a new president, Yamando Orsi. The opposition victory ends five years of conservative leadership. The former history teacher has pledged to contain crime and to help the economy recover. Two of the former big four in men's tennis are teaming up. Novak Djokovic hired one-time rival Andy Murray as his coach, welcoming Murray to his team. Djokovic called him one of the toughest opponents. Their first event together is January's Australian Open. And Bert is battering Britain. Torrential rain, flooding, and powerful winds are being felt across the United Kingdom. Homes are underwater and travel is in utter chaos. At least five people have died so far. NBC News international correspondent Matt Bradley joins us now from London with the latest. Hey, Matt. 
Well, Storm Bird has been causing a lot of damage and at least three deaths in England and Wales. And some winds have been clocked at more than 80 miles per hour. Hundreds of homes have flooded and roads were washed out. Now, the problem here is that some forecasters are taking blame for not predicting the size of the storm adequately ahead of time. Now, in one of the hard hit areas of Wales, the Met Office, which does the weather here, said it was only a yellow level storm rather than a red level storm. Now, the Met Office has defended itself, saying they gave adequate warning for Bert 48 hours in advance. But there's still a lot of anger here, including against the ruling party who are wasting no time in blaming the previous conservative government who took office, who held office back in July before those last elections. They called, in fact, the environment minister said today that the flood defenses were in the worst condition on record when the current Labour government took office last July. So now storms like Bert are a lot milder than the kinds of weather that we get in the States, but the outcomes are similar. Wind and rain in real life causing storms in politics and as we know from covering the U.S., it's mostly when the weather is much worse than expected. People are killed, injured or displaced, and the government is caught unprepared. And then often the political opposition uses weather as a weapon or people vent their anger with the government. We saw that with hurricanes in the States recently and that flooding in Spain. And that's exactly what is happening here. But it's not over yet. The Met Office has said that Bert will start to pull away from the British Isles today. But there's still more than 100 areas that have been designated as having flood warnings. Matt Bradley in our London Bureau. Thank you. Turning now to the war in Ukraine. Russia launching new drone attacks as Ukraine struggles to defend its city. The escalation is happening just two months before President-elect Trump takes office. He has vowed to work to end that conflict. NBC News chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel has the latest from Ukraine. Russia fired more missiles at the Ukrainian cities of Kharkiv and Odessa. Ukraine's President Zelensky saying the attacks must not go unanswered. The war in Ukraine is escalating, with both sides rushing to gain territory before President-elect Trump's promise to bring a ceasefire. And in what may be the late rounds of this long fight, Russia has the upper hand. Despite recruitment drives, Ukraine is running out of men. So increasingly, women are taking up the responsibility. We joined a group of soldiers arming up near Kyiv. They call themselves the Witches of Bucha. 90% of this unit are women. Many of their sons and husbands are out fighting on the front lines. So they have stepped up volunteering to defend the capital. These women don't believe that even if Trump brokers a deal, Putin will honor it. So they're training for close combat. Valentina is a grandmother. Her son and son-in-law are both out on the front lines. I don't believe this war can be stopped with a negotiation, she says. Putin can't be trusted. In three to five years, he'll come back. NATO is so concerned about the escalation here that tomorrow officials from the alliance and Ukraine hold an emergency meeting to coordinate strategy. Richard Engel, NBC News, Kyiv. Before we go, it is time for the future of everything. Just when you thought scammers couldn't get more creative, they're now using AI to fool people through video chats. We'll explain. Plus, sequels are taking over the box office. Are they becoming more popular than their original? That discussion straight ahead. Welcome back. It is time now for the future of everything. They say what you see is what you get. But thanks to the growing trend of AI related scams, that is not always the case. Now, there's a new concern, fake video chats. They're designed to make you think you're talking to someone you can trust. NBC News Daily anchor Kate Snow shows us how to detect those deep fakes. We've shown you how imposters can use artificial intelligence to clone voices on the phone. It's literally a matter of dragging and dropping audio clips into yeah, this program. That's it. As a way to scam loved ones or colleagues who think they're talking to you. Hello. Are you crazy busy? I forgot my corporate card. Oh, no. But as technology advances, the scams do, too. Experts now warning you can't always trust what you see. Take this case in Florida. The owner of a title company, Lauren Albrecht, was trying to verify the identity of a woman who was selling property. Margaret? And luckily, caught on. After the second pause, I realized, like, 
This is 100% a video playing on a loop. It is not real. Her first clue? Margaret, can you raise your right hand? The fake person could not. That's a red flag, but not every scam gets caught. We are seeing horrible extortions that are happening to individuals, to grandmas, to grandpas. We're seeing CEOs being attacked. We're seeing organizations being attacked. Hani Farid is a professor at UC Berkeley and co-founder of Get Real Labs, which works to detect deep fakes. So let me share my screen here. We asked his team to show us just how convincing AI can make a video call using material of me they could find online. It's about seven seconds, okay? Hey, sweetie, can you pick up milk, eggs, and cereal at the store on your way home tonight? Thanks. See you later tonight. Oh, my. These pre-produced videos troubling enough, but Fareed says there's more. Now what I can do is in real time, on a video call like this one, I could be a deep fake. Good morning, baby. The man you see here in the lower left demonstrating how to pull off the ruse through live video chat using AI to superimpose a face on top of his own in real time. A new report by the Alliance to Counter Crime Online warns of a tsunami of fraud using deep fake technology. In Hong Kong, an employee sent $25 million to a fraudster, thinking senior officers from the company had instructed her to make the transfer on a video conference. We're trying to sound an alarm, and we're also trying to urge our lawmakers to do more to regulate these dangerous technologies. Experts say every family should create a code word to verify their identities to each other. This is the world we're entering in. It's now going to have to be physical interactions that we tr are the only things we trust. Because seeing is no longer believing. That was Kate Snow reporting. All right, if you were defying gravity this weekend, you were not alone. Wicked dominated the domestic box office, earning $114 million. We will note the film is produced by our sister company, Universal Pictures. But this year's box office has been ruled by movies we've sort of seen before. Like, that's the top 10 earning movies so far this year. All of those are sequels, right? Despite the usual stigma when it comes to the word, people flock to the box office for movies like Deadpool and Wolverine and Inside Out 2. So does that mean Hollywood is going to go all and beat down original IPs to a pulp, right? Uh, let's bring in Bravo personality and host of Shaken and Disturbed, Darren Carp, to talk about all things sequels. Darren, just break it down for us. This, like, bounce back was very needed in Hollywood after the strikes. But is the trend of sequels the future of movies here? I think so. I mean, I, I, it's funny because a lot of the moviegoers are complaining of lack of creativity. As you just said, the top 10 box offices this is the first time in box office history worldwide that they're all sequels. And yet people seem to want that in their in their movie going thing. So, you know, I think creativity is actually going to come out in other ways. Uh, and we can get to that in a little bit. But absolutely. I mean, if you think about it, Hollywood really suffered in 2023 from the writer's strike. Of course, we had a couple other strikes that really put a damage on the industry. So Hollywood's really looking to make movies well. And one, one thing that they need is IP that they know audiences are going to love. So this is a trend moving forward for sure. So... Do you think the trend, the change is driven by Hollywood saying, OK, the strike was really tough. It's going to be cheaper and easier for us to just do stories that have been out there, be it on Broadway or elsewhere, or do a sequel, then come up with something entirely new? Or is it that people genuinely seem to be more interested now, despite past data, in seeing follow ups to some movies that they loved? Kind of a, it's, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. I mean, I certainly think there's less marketing that needs to go with already established IP. I mean, we're seeing that now with some live adaptations coming out next year. We've got Snow White, Lilo and Stitch, How to Train Your Dragon. These are all very popular names that we all know and kind of love. So I think moviegoers are already inherently going to go see that. However, as we've seen from past sequels, I mean... Listen, sequels are sort of this like bad stepchild of Hollywood. I mean, look at Indiana Jones. Those didn't perform as well in the box office. However, like we said this year, I do think it has to do with the IP that we're talking about. Mm. And even though they are sequels, I think they have to be really well done to get people to go out there. So it isn't just a matter of Hollywood saving money. It also the writing has to be there. The story mm. has to be there. Yeah, when you see something like Wicked this weekend and then Gladiator 2 also coming out and people were trying to make Glicked happen, which I feel like <laughs> Glicked is not going to happen, but no. you want to tell us otherwise, feel free. But are you sort of team adaptations or team sequel right now? Should we read into the fact that a long-awaited sequel was beat out by the adaptation, right? Yeah. Or vice versa. I yeah. 
I, I mean, I, I do, I do, I do definitely think we should start paying attention to this. I mean, next year we're just going to be flooded. Like I said, we've got Snow White coming out, Moana, a lot of these Broadway adaptations. I mean, even the even even a movie that wasn't a sequel that ranked the highest this year was It Ends With Us, which happened to be an adaptation of a novel. So we're going to mm. see so much more of that. I think adaptations, again, that built-in IP is just driving that even more. But the creativity is going to come in how we do that. I mean, look at The Penguin on Max. Massive, mm -hmm. massive hit of a sort of a Batman villain that we had IP of, yeah. done in a completely different way that I think smashed expectations. And so the creativity is going to come with using that IP in a different way. Yeah, how do you think we see this moving forward playing out on the silver screen? There are shows like Penguin, which was great, and I was definitely drawn to it just because I like at least the Christopher Nolan Batman yeah. series. And then there's also this trend I think I keep seeing of big movie stars being involved in TV shows in a way that I don't remember seeing five years ago. Yeah, I, I I mean, listen, I'm a little bit biased. I'm a, I'm a TV person mm -hmm. way more than I'm a movie person, but TV is way, are way better than movies. I think people want to be drawn out of their characters now. I mean, it can be much more fun watching a 10-hour series broken up into 10 different parts than watching a three-hour movie some days. I mean, I think, that's, I think that's a response to people's attention spans as well. So I think TV is going to play a major part in these adaptations, getting people hyped up for this IP, and hopefully maybe seeing it in the silver screen eventually so people can go back into the movie theaters like we have always wanted. All right. Time will tell. Darren Karp, thank you. We appreciate it. Thanks. And thank you at home. That does it for us tonight. I'm Ellison Barber. We will see you tomorrow. But until then, stay tuned now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.